Mob movies are a perennial favorite for moviegoers, but what about the real-life gangsters who inspired the stories? Today we're going to take a stroll on the wrong side of the tracks and have a look at some of the mobsters who have influenced not only Hollywood filmmakers, but also uh, had a major impact on the history of the 20th century and beyond. Here are the 20 most notorious mob bosses in history. Number 20. Boris Neyfeld Amongst the baddest sorts of mob boss, Boris Neyfeld, who also went by the name Boba, is a guy with a very shady past. Let's poke about inside the life of a Russian Mafia member. He arrived in the United States from Belarusia in the former USSR in 1979 and soon settled in Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. After a very brief stint as a cab driver, he then took on a life of crime, beginning with the usual petty crimes and progressing to grand larceny and then winding up on probation. This, he appeared to reason, was the perfect opportunity to begin a gang of jewel thieves, as one does. Shortly after this, he became the bodyguard and driver for the Brighton Beach mob boss Evzi Agron, and he became one of the boss's most trusted associates. There was a failed assassination attempt in 1984, but he took over a good deal of the operation from the boss thereafter. Then in 1985, a successful attempt ended the life of Agron, and Neyfeld became the lead enforcer for the Ukrainian mob boss in the area. There's evidence that he was involved in the murder of his former boss, but he continues to deny it to this day. He then got into drug trafficking in the form of a massive heroin smuggling operation and avoided detection by the DEA, rising through the ranks to become the Russian crime boss of Brighton Beach. There were seemingly endless wars amongst the mobsters and a constant threat to take him out, everything from car bombs to the usual bullets, and he survived and was eventually arrested by the feds in 1994 on drug trafficking charges. He managed to strike a deal and would be sentenced to time served plus probation and in 2007 was arrested once again, eventually going to prison until being released in 2014. After another brief stint behind bars, once again, he was then finally released and now lives back in Mother Russia. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Al Capone Al Capone is also known as Scarface and was a legendary figure in the world of organized crime during the Prohibition era of the 1920s. With his stylish suits, cigar in hand, and an aura of mystery, Capone has become an enduring icon in pop culture. Born in 1899 in Brooklyn, New York, he rose to prominence as the head of the Chicago Outfit, a powerful criminal organization involved in bootlegging, gambling, and other illicit activities. His empire thrived during the Prohibition era, when the production and sale of alcohol were banned, leading to a lucrative black market for booze. Capone's reputation for violence and his ability to evade law enforcement would earn him a fearsome reputation. However, he would also be known for his charm and charisma, making him a favorite subject of the media and the public. One of the most infamous events associated with him is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929. While he was not directly involved, the incident did involve the murder of seven members of a rival gang, further solidifying his ruthless image. Capone's criminal activities would eventually catch up with him, and in 1931, he was convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to prison. Interestingly, it was his inability to pay taxes, rather than his more heinous crimes, that would lead to his downfall. Number 18. Simeon Moglevich Simeon Moglevich is the Ukrainian-born Russian mafia boss, and in fact, he's believed to be the boss of bosses, as in the big guy at the top of it all, the Russian mafia syndicates all over the world. He's been tied to drug trafficking, a whole bunch of contract killings, international prostitution, and selling nuclear material. Yes, he is a very bad man indeed, and has had more than 100 fronts for his shady criminal enterprise and bank accounts in no less than 27 countries. The thing with this guy is that there are sources that have linked him to the highest levels in the Kremlin, stating that he has a good relationship with those in the seats of power. He's also been linked to the international energy sector. That would suggest that much of Europe's energy market could, in effect, be held to ransom by the Russian mob, and this guy has the control over the natural gas pipelines in Russia and much of Eastern Europe. 
He's been arrested once. Back in 2008, Russian police would make a case against him in connection with tax evasion charges. But within three years, they had dropped the charges, and he continued to perpetrate his bad deeds ever since. Number 17. Shigaharu Shirai The Yakuza is the name for the transnational crime syndicates with Japanese origins. It basically translates into gangster in English. They're also sometimes known by the word Gokudo, which means the extreme path, and, well, it is definitely extreme. This is Shigaharu Shirai, the former boss of the Yakuza who went on the run back in 2003. He was once one of the top guys in the Japanese crime organizations, but fled from the country when he allegedly murdered another gang leader, the deputy of a rival gang. In fact, seven members of his own gang went to jail for this very crime for between 12 to 17 years each. He, on the other hand, escaped to Thailand and lived a low-key life for more than 14 years before being recognized in a photo on the internet and captured. His downfall was, of course, his tattoos. His incredible full torso artwork was snapped and uploaded to the internet, and the picture went viral, and unfortunately for him, he was recognized because of it. He also has an unmistakable mark of his life in the Yakuza. He has one little finger missing. The amputation of the little finger is a commonly used punishment amongst this violent gang. What it all amounts to, however, was the easy identification and subsequent arrest of the old gangster for murder. Number 16. Matteo Messina Denaro. The shadowy, murky world of the Mafia doesn't really allow for official bosses and the public knowledge of who's really in charge of the running of this crime organization. But, that being said, it's usually a bit of an open secret about those who are believed to be at the top. Since the arrest of Bernardo Provenzano back in 2006, it's widely believed that the current Sicilian Mafia boss is one Matteo Messina Denaro, who also goes by the disconcerting nickname of Diabolique. He sounds just lovely already, doesn't he? Denaro found himself in the spotlight when the Italian magazine El Espresso put him on the front cover and declared, here is the new mafia boss. He was then listed as one of the top 10 most wanted criminals in the world, but for a man who has been on the run since 1993, a little more heat probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference in the grand scheme of things. And when you're the big cheese for one of the most feared and violent crime organizations on the planet, you're likely as not already fairly resigned to the fact that you will likely die violently or go to jail for the rest of your life. He remains the unchallenged boss of bosses in the whole of the Cosa Nostra. Number 15. Matthew Matty Madonna Matthew Madonna is a major player in the world of organized crime and is a high-ranking member of the Lucchese crime family, one of the five families that dominate organized crime in New York City. Madonna's criminal career spans several decades, and he's been involved in a variety of illegal activity, which includes loan sharking, extortion, illegal gambling, and labor racketeering. Madonna is widely recognized as a member of the old guard of the Lucchese crime family, and he's held various leadership positions within the organization. He's had several run-ins with the law, leading to arrests and convictions on various charges over the years, and these legal troubles have often resulted in a prison sentence, but he's remained a resilient figure within the criminal underworld. Number 14. Charles Lucky Luciano Lucky Luciano was born in Italy and spent most of his life and criminal career in the United States. He began his criming activities in the notorious Five Points Gang, who were active in Lower Manhattan from the end of the 19th and into the early 20th century. This area would be full of brothels and gambling dens and was a pretty dangerous place to be, especially after dark. Living conditions were quite poor, and life here was very difficult. It's famous for producing some especially tough criminals, which includes Lucky Luciano, Johnny Torrio, and Al Capone. But the beginnings like this, you can imagine how Lucky's life was likely to go. It turned out that he was headed towards forming modern organized crime in the United States. He became the first official boss of the infamous Genovese crime family and was essentially responsible for the creation of the National Crime Syndicate, which is a confederation of many different crime organizations, including the Italian-American Mafia and the Jewish Mob, and also the Irish and African-American organized crime gangs. This syndicate employed the services of Murder, Inc. for literally hundreds of murders, so you know, Lucky Luciano was a fairly influential bad guy. In the end, though, despite eventually being tried and convicted of running a prostitution racket and being sentenced in 1936 to 30 to 50 years in prison, 
He actually struck a deal during the Second World War with the Department of the Navy to provide naval intelligence as a result of his connections. His sentence was then commuted after the war, and he was deported to Italy where he died in 1962, and his body was returned to America and then buried there. Number 13. Meyer Lansky Perhaps better known as the mob's accountant, Meyer Lansky was a significant player in American organized crime all throughout much of the 20th century. He was an associate of Lucky Luciano and had a major role in creating the National Crime Syndicate in the U.S., so you know he was a real gem. He met Bugsy Siegel in childhood and they became lifelong friends and bootlegging pals, creating the Bugs and Meyer Mob, a violent gang of the Prohibition era. Lansky was part of the Jewish mob and built a massive gambling empire that had influence all around the world, and it's believed that he had percentages of casinos in everywhere from Las Vegas to London and Cuba to the Bahamas. He was also hugely influential in the Italian-American Mafia on the account of his relationship with Luciano, meaning that he was a really significant part of the consolidation of all the power in the organized crime world. He was a major player, but somehow had avoided ever being found guilty of anything worse than illegal gambling. He was an extremely successful gangster in financial terms, and his estimated worth was $20 million before he fled to Cuba in 1959. That would be the equivalent of $160 million today. But after his death in 1983, his estate said to have only been worth about $57,000 or $167,477 in today's money. Number 12. Carlo Gambino Carlo Gambino was the head of the Gambino crime family of New York City. In fact, he went on to be the big boss of everything when, in 1959, Vito Genovese was sent to prison. That was when Gambino took over the leadership of the commission. This was the organizing body that oversaw the entirety of the American Mafia, and there he stayed until his death of a heart attack in 1976. Remarkably for a guy who was so connected and very powerful, he only ever served 22 months in prison, and that was for tax evasion all the way back in 1937. But this is the way it seems to be for these high-up guys. They insulate themselves in order to provide a buffer between the crimes that were committed on their orders and the repercussions of said crimes. He began his criminal career in the Genovese crime family and then got embroiled in a war between two rival gangs who were run by so-called Old World Mafia. These were organizations which began in the old country and then moved operations to the United States. When the war ended, Gambino found himself as a soldier in one of the five families, the Mangiano family, and there were years of fighting and assassinations and such. Then eventually, Genovese took over the family. He was in charge until eventually being imprisoned, and that's when Gambino took control. It was under his control that the crime family grew to hold such power and influence. He oversaw decades worth of crime and murder until he died at the age of 74 in 1976, having avoided several assassination attempts, legal issues, and even the threat of deportation. Number 11. Vito Genovese Up next, we have another Italian-born mobster who spent his crime career in the United States and rose through the ranks of the Italian-American Mafia to become one of the most powerful men in criminal history. Genovese, like many other mobsters that we've seen, rose to prominence during the Prohibition era when he became an enforcer. His childhood friend Lucky Luciano was also a prominent figure during this time, and their association and business ran in parallel all throughout their lives. Genovese was a major player in the expansion of the heroin trade to an international market. Then, there was a brief moment when he ran back to Italy just before the Second World War and actually supported Mussolini and the fascists while he was at it. This, he claimed, was because he was nervous about getting deported back to the United States, where he would have been facing murder charges. But stuff seemed to turn around for him, and he did return to America in 1945, becoming mentor to the future boss of the Genovese crime family. He ultimately attempted to take over the entire enterprise with a botched assassination attempt on Frank Costello in 1959 when he tried to take the title of Boss of Bosses. But his attempts to consolidate power were foiled when a raid by the police interrupted the Mafia summit that he had called. He was later convicted on narcotics charges and sent to prison for 15 years, where he died in 1969. Number 10. Frank Costello now we have Frank Costello, the would-be victim of the attempted assassination by Vito Genovese and the big boss of the Luciano crime family. Costello had been involved with all kinds of activities and petty crimes since he was a small boy. He had traveled to the United States to live in New York City with his family when he was a child. 
At the age of 13, he became a member of a local gang, committing a bunch of petty crimes and going by the name of Frankie. He formed a friendship with Lucky Luciano and became a central figure in the development of organized crime in the United States in the 20th century. He was also known to be involved with Vito Genovese, Tommy Lucchese, Meyer Lansky, and Bugsy Siegel. They formed a gang that had interests in robbery, theft, extortion, gambling, and narcotics, which would later grow into the organized crime syndicate that ran most illegal activities in the United States. Costello went on to have an extremely powerful role in the Italian-American mafia as concierge and then boss. After the attempt on his life, he then stepped down from his leadership and handed things over to Genovese after all. Number 9. John Gotti John Joseph Gotti Jr. was an infamous gangster and head of the New York Gambino crime family. He rose to prominence at a young age when it transpired that he was one of the family's biggest earners, and when the FBI indicated a bunch of his crew for narcotics, he was fearful that he would be killed by then-boss Paul Castellano. So, he did what any aspiring mobster would do. He organized the killing of Castellano and took over the family. Gotti began one of the most powerful crime boss reigns in the entire country. He was popular and a figure of fascination for many people, and despite being at the center of three high-profile trials in the 1980s, he actually escaped without a conviction each time earning him the nickname of the Teflon Don. Despite the failings to get Gotti, law enforcement agencies continue to work on cases against him, and eventually, with the assistance of his own underboss, Salvatore Gravano, he was finally convicted in 1992 after Gravano turned state's evidence. This list of convictions would be long, five murders, conspiracies, racketeering, obstruction of justice, tax evasion, illegal gambling, extortion, and loan sharking. He was then sentenced to life in prison without parole, and he died behind bars in 2002. Number 8. Joe Bonanno Joe Bonanno was a major figure in the world of organized crime and is widely recognized as one of the founding fathers of the American Mafia and an influential mob boss in the 20th century. Despite this infamy, he had an ability to maintain a low profile while exercising substantial control within the criminal underworld. He was known for his measured intelligence, discretion, and diplomacy, which had allowed him to navigate the turbulent waters of the Mafia with both skill and cunning. His rise to prominence involved various illicit activities. In particular, he was tangled up in illegal gambling, bootlegging during prohibition, and labor racketeering, the trifecta of Mafia criming. He established himself as a powerful and influential figure within the Mafia, earning respect and loyalty from his subordinates and colleagues. His leadership style was a pretty business-like approach, which was into discipline and unity within the organization. However, this did not make him immune to internal strife and conflict. He would be involved in a notorious power struggle with other high-ranking mob figures, which ultimately solidified his reputation as an effective and highly strategic mobster. Number 7. Joe Colombo As the boss of the Colombo crime family, one of the five families of New York City, Joe Colombo had massive power and influence in the 20th century. He's also famous for starting the Italian-American Civil Rights League, which was begun as a political advocacy group that also rather conveniently did a whole lot of defense representation of many of the Colombo crime family members. The general idea of the League appears to have been to have denied the existence of the Mafia, which it still does to this very day. Not sure if people actually believe them or not, though. He was deeply ensnared in the First Colombo War, which resulted in kidnappings of high-ranking members of the Profaci family, and then afterwards, once the ringleader of the crimes went to jail, Colombo continued to control the family. But then after Gallo was released, he sought revenge and instigated the Second Colombo War, which had ended with Colombo being shot and paralyzed in 1971. He would then perish in 1978. Number 6. Albert Anastasia Albert Anastasia went by the weird monikers of the Mad Hatter and Lord High Executioner, and was a totally ruthless figure of the American Mafia. Born in Calabria in Italy in 1902, he immigrated to the United States and then rose to become a prominent mobster in New York City during the 20th century. He was a key figure in the underworld's illegal activities during the Prohibition era, including bootlegging and racketeering, and was feared for his willingness to employ violence as a means of control and retribution. The Prohibition was essentially the making of the mob, with many of its central characters finding their crime legs in that era. 
and the circumstances to develop their underworld activities were equally as perfect. Kind of the opposite that the whole notion of temperance really advocated for, but there you go. His notoriety would be further cemented when he became the head of the notorious Murder Inc. Syndicate, who was responsible for carrying out countless contract killings on behalf of the mob. His leadership of this ruthless hit squad earned him a fearsome reputation within the criminal underworld. He played a big role in the formation of the modern Cosa Nostra and his ascension to the position of boss of the Gambino crime family. This made him one of the most powerful and influential mob bosses in all of New York City. He had numerous brushes with the law, but had managed to evade prosecution on multiple occasions. His violent death in a barber shop in 1957, known as the Barbershop Hit, is one of the most notorious mob assassinations in history, with numerous conspiracy theories that surround it. But to be honest, a violent and infamous ending was really the only way that things could have gone for a guy like Albert Anastasia. Number 5. Vincent Gigante Vincent Gigante, who also went by the name of The Chin, began his professional life as a boxer and then progressed from that into the role of enforcer for the Luciano crime family. Gigante was actually the guy with the gun in the failed assassination attempt on Frank Costello in 1957, but it was drug trafficking offenses that would eventually place him behind bars in 1959. He would be sentenced to seven years for his crimes, and during that time he shared a cell with Vito Genovese, which led to Gigante becoming a capo and overseeing his own crew in the later Genovese crime family. It's funny how these things all turned out, but probably not a ringing endorsement for the effectiveness of the criminal justice system as a whole in its ability to prevent any future criming activity. Number 4. Tony Accardo Tony Accardo, or Joe Batters, or Big Tuna as he was also known, the mob really does come up with some classic nicknames, doesn't it? Was a mobster who was on the scene for many decades with a criminal career that lasted close to 80 years. He began, as many of them did, as a small-time petty thief and hoodlum before rising through the ranks to acquire the rank of regular boss in the Chicago outfit in 1947. In the end, he was the big boss of the entire outfit by 1972. He was known for his sharp intelligence, and it was once said of him that Accardo had more brains for breakfast than Capone had in a lifetime. He was so wily, in fact, that despite having an arrest record beginning in 1922, when he eventually died at the age of 86, he had only ever spent one single night behind bars. Number 3. Raymond Patriarca Sr. This mobster from Rhode Island became the longtime head of the Patriarca crime family and held control over much of New England for the better part of three decades. He began in all the usual sorts of ways, with safe-cracking, theft, armed robbery, and stuff like that, and this was enough to earn him his stripes, while also getting him five years in prison, of which he somehow managed to only serve about a four-month stay. During the 1940s, he rose to power, and by the mid-1950s, he had an iron grip on the operation. He had such a stranglehold that literally every card game prostitution ring, and any illegal business whatsoever in Providence had to pay a kickback to him. This was enforced with ruthless violence and continued on for decades until he was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder in 1970 and then sentenced to 10 years. He continued to run the family from jail and would be released on parole in 1975, then dying in 1984. Number 2. Carmine Persicho Carmine the Snake Persicho was a notorious figure in the American Mafia known for his long and influential tenure as the boss of the Colombo crime family. Despite his involvement in a wide range of illicit activities, which included extortion, loan sharking, and illegal gambling, he had actually managed to avoid any long-term imprisonment for most of his life. He was a robust and edifying figure inside of the family, known for his no-nonsense approach to everything, and his notoriety grew even further when he was convicted for his role in the Colombo crime family's bloody internal war during the 1990s, which included numerous homicides. He would then be sentenced to prison in 1986 and remain behind bars until his eventual death. Number 1. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel Bugsy Siegel was one of the most influential mobsters of the mid-20th century. He would be at the forefront of the development of the Las Vegas Strip and also had massive influence within the Jewish mob, as well as longtime friendships that had ensured 
his close connections with the Italian-American mafia. Like many others, Siegel got his beginnings in big crime back during the Prohibition era when he was a bootlegger, and this, it seems, would be the gateway into many other extremely profitable crimes that were available to any aspiring mobster of the time. This, of course, led to bigger and better things for Bugsy. He became a hitman and general muscle guy in the 1930s, and then, after having avoided a murder charge in 1942, he set his sights on Las Vegas, becoming involved in the financing of some of the original casinos that were out there. He's known for the Vegas casino skimming activities of his final years, and eventually would be shot dead by a sniper through the window of his Beverly Hills mansion back in 1947. That's all from the seedy underbelly for today. Are you a fan of gangster movies? And which of these criminal types has captured your imagination the most? You should let me know all about it down in the comments section down below. Also, be sure to check out the other cool things that are showing up on the screen right now, because I'm sure that they're awesome. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.